tell us a little bit about the backstory. Why actually did George Gershwin write, write this tune? Well, it's kind of a funny story. Um, actually, um, it was in the, the 20s, you know, and um, there was a guy named Paul Whiteman who was a band leader, and he uh, wanted to do this concert uh, called An Experiment in Modern Music. And he wanted to make the symphony hall more accessible for, uh, for the modern audiences of the day. Sounds it's kind of funny. They're still trying to do the same thing today. Um, and he wanted to have this big concert with some new music on it. And uh, he asked George Gershwin in, uh, around November of 1923, uh, he asked him if he would write a, a piece for this new concert and uh, that was going to be in February of 1924. So just a few months later, and uh, George Gershwin said, you know, I'd love to, but uh, there's not enough time to get the revisions to the orchestra and all this. And so he said, you know, I'm sorry, but I have to decline. Well, then um, a couple months later in, uh, I believe, January, he's uh, shooting pool with, with Buddy De Silva, one of his composing buddies, and also his brother, uh, Ira is over there reading the newspaper, uh, and he says, uh, oh, look at this, Paul Whiteman's having a big concert in Aeolian Hall uh, in February, and guess what? Uh, it says here, George Gershwin is busy writing a new concerto. <laughs> and, and George you know, said, wait a minute, I told him I don't have time to do this. And uh, so he got on the phone the next day and, and called him up and said, uh, you know, what's, what's going on? You know, and, he said, uh, well, uh, George, you know, look, one of my, my uh, rivals in the, the big bands uh, is planning to steal my idea, so I had to go forward with it. Uh, and so, you know, he talked him into it, and so now he only had about five weeks left uh, to write the piece. And so uh, he wrote a lot of it apparently on the train to Boston, and he said all the, the clanging of the train, and, the, and he wrote it all about the sounds that are... Uh, you know, of, of New York and the sounds of America. And it was originally, I think, called uh, American Rhapsody when he was writing it. Okay. Uh, and then it became the Rhapsody in Blue, I think, based on an art exhibit that he had attended. And I also heard recently that uh, Ira Gershwin, who, who was his, you know, lyricist and collaborator, um, actually told him at one point, uh, he said, you know, it's, it sounds good when he was writing the concerto, but he said, you know, in the middle, I think you need something softer. And he goes, there's a melody in one of your, your idea books that would be perfect. You know, da, da, dee, da, 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 da. And uh, so he actually suggested that, which became the love theme, which is the most recognizable part of the, uh, of the piece. Interesting. Um, so he wrote the piece and finished it just eight days before the, the premiere. And he passed it off to Paul Whiteman's arranger, whose name is uh, Ferd Graffe. And he is the one who actually orchestrated it out for that first performance in, in Aeolian Hall. Uh, so that, you know, he, he deserves a lot of credit for that success of that first performance. Uh, Ferd Graffe, of course, went on to write the Grand Canyon Suite and many other uh, successful pieces. Uh, so that's kind of how the, the performance went down, there were, it was a big deal. There were a, a lot of uh, famous composers there. Uh, John Philip Sousa was in the audience, uh, as well as Serge Rachmaninoff. And here's, um, you know, George Gershwin, only I think 26 years old. Um, and he, that was his entree into legitimate music uh, and became, uh, that was, you know, of course a huge piece and, and has became so uh, renowned 25, 26 pieces. In the uh, one concert? On one concert, wow. yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, I think the people were starting to get a little bored and, and antsy, and the uh, Rhapsody in Blue, I think, was next to the last. Whoa. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. But, but everybody perked up when uh, they began to play the opening strain, the famous, you know, the, you know. Uh, and that was. Um, Clarinet. It was scored for clarinet, okay. and uh, apparently the clarinet player, uh, just kind of joking around as musicians do, he made a big glissando, and uh, 
And, and Gershwin uh, heard it, and he said, yeah, that's perfect. He says, just do it just like that. Okay. So, so now, personally, um, what inspired you to actually memorize this entire piece and, and decide to play it? Well, um, it's just such an iconic piece of American music, and, um, and it's sort of a bridge between uh, jazz and classical, and I actually did my, my doctoral dissertation um, at North Texas about uh, Gunther Schuller and also uh, the trombonist John Swallow and uh, the piece that Schuller had written for John. Um, and of course, Gunther Schuller is known for what's called third stream music. And it's combining European classical music with American jazz. And as Gunther said, let's, we have one mainstream over here, European classical music, one mainstream over here, American jazz. So let's get them married and they'll have an offspring and we'll call it third stream music. Um, so that was intriguing to me, you know, how you could blend these things. Um, Rhapsody in Blue gets talked about whenever you talk about third stream music, even though I don't know uh, if it technically qualifies under Gunther Schuller's definition of, of third stream music. But in learning it, uh, it was fascinating to me how the chordal structure is so much like modern jazz chords. And it was uh, fascinating to me to get inside uh, all of Gershwin's chords and how it's very, very much, you know, uh, what we call 13th chords and what I call my chocolate and strawberry chords uh, that uh, he uses throughout the piece. So the same things that, that great jazz players like Bill Evans and Oscar Peterson and, and everyone uses to this day. So even though uh, George Gershwin wasn't really a jazz player per se, uh, but he certainly uh, chordally was thinking uh, like jazz. He was definitely ahead of his time, uh, and, and what a great pianist. Of course, he came out of the Tin Pan Alley tradition. He was a song plugger and uh, wrote, of course, a lot of you know, Broadway classics. Of course. Speaking of which, I understand you're doing a total Gershwin concert in January, is it? Tell me a little bit about that. Right. I'm going to be playing an all Gershwin concert for the Dallas Jazz Piano Society. Okay. which is headed up by the great Dan Hurley. Right, from and, uh, Right, my, uh, my mentor. And uh, it's going to feature you know, all of uh, Gershwin's music, um, of course, most, mostly the piano, maybe, maybe some, some vocals. But uh, so pretty much you know, kind of everything else besides the Rhapsody in Blue. Interesting. And uh, one, of, one of the iconic pieces, of course, is the I Got Rhythm. Uh, okay. which now has become every jazz player has to play I Got Rhythm uh, just to prove themselves. So it's become second to the blues, the most recorded jazz uh, structure. Now you're doing this at the Salmon Center, right? At, and how can people find out about getting tickets? Yeah, the Salmon Center for the Arts. Uh, so you can go to, uh, I believe it's called uh, SalmonCenterForTheArts.org mm -hmm. or uh, search for that on the, uh, on the web and, and find out uh, tickets also, the, the Dallas Jazz Piano Society, I think that uh, you can, you know, uh, give a, look them up on the web also. Um, also check my website, MikeBogle.com, um, for a link to my upcoming performances. You sing also, don't you? Yes, yes, I am a singer also, and uh, as a matter of fact, I'm doing a concert uh, also at the Salmon Center for the Arts for their cabaret series um, in December. I believe December 17th. Okay. So with the, uh, for the cabaret and the cabaret series, and I'm gonna be playing with my bass player, Lou Harless, uh, on that concert. And then for the Dallas Jazz Piano Concert for the Gershwin in uh, January, I'll be also with Lou and Andrew Griffith on the drums. Exciting times. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Lana, and uh, it's my pleasure.